Okay, so let's start with the, the introduction. We hope that more people can, can join. So um, welcome to this um, last session. In fact, last session of the, the Open Air Week uh, 2020. It was a, a great week with several sessions, um, lots of excellent presentations and then the speakers. Uh, building open science gateways to open and linking research outcomes is the, um, the topic of this session where we are going to present uh, uh, the open air uh, connect related services that are uh, supporting uh, the services that open air have to support uh, research uh, communities and research uh, infrastructures um, so um, just before we start with the with the topic and the, with the presentations of the speakers i'm just i was keeping uh all participants are, are muted and ca cannot show video but so you have po the possibility to ask questions in the q a uh, we will uh, answer all questions directly using uh, our audio uh, from the, the the speakers or in, in the in the chat uh, all the um, presentations and uh, recordings will be available uh, later today um, in the in the in the open air week uh, website and uh, the recordings also in the um, will be linked from the, the this website the, the, this web page but also in our available in our YouTube channel. Um, please use uh, the hashtag open air week 2020 to to share your thoughts in the in the different social media channels specifically in the in Twitter. So um, the, this session uh, on the on the on the the open open science gateways, the services that we are offering to research communities and research infrastructures, we'll have three uh, main blocks. Okay, we will start uh, with uh, Alessia Bardi from that is the manager, uh, the product manager of Open Air Connect, um, to present. Uh, the relation between the um, these services that we are providing to research communities and uh, research infrastructures with uh, the open air research graph an example of one of the the latest um, gateways that we have developed the open air uh, covid-19 uh, open science gateway and then we will stop for 2 3 minutes to to receive questions so we will try to have a more interactive session not to have all presentations because we have several speakers it's a more risky uh, way to, to, to manage the session, but let's let's do our best. Then we will have um, uh, five use cases. Uh, so real six. open science, six, sorry, six use cases. Uh, so real uh, gateways that we have uh, in, in action uh, to present uh, to you. Uh, and after these use cases, um, we will have also time for questions and answers. And then we will finish uh, uh, with uh, Alessia again, and with uh, my colleague uh, Ari from the Tina Research Center to uh, present uh, some of the, the recent open air collaborations projects that are also uh, benefiting from these services. So, uh, Alessia, and the floor is yours to present the, the open air research graph in the connection with the service. You can share your screen. Uh, be aware that you can put your questions, you can share your comments in the chat. And you can put your questions during Alessia's uh, this first two first presentations from Alessia, and then we will uh, reply to your questions just at the end of the second um, presentation from Alessia. And welcome all. Okay, so I think you can see my screen now. Perfect. Perfect. So. So, if the other speakers would, you can close your camera and uh, just to have. Okay, so the open air research graph or how I learned to stop worrying and use connect services. So why we should be worried? Because researchers have many questions, especially in relation to open science and all the different aspects of open science and on scholarly communication in general. So it is often very difficult to find, for example, the research activities of a specific discipline because the research products, the research results, the publications, data sets, software, 
and all other types of research products that are produced by researchers are scattered, are scattered across many different repositories, uh, archives, data centers, and it's not easy to find out uh, where to go to find them. And also, if I'm a researcher using uh, a research infrastructure, a digital infrastructure, where can I find the results that have been produced thanks to services that my research infrastructure offers to its researchers? How can I know if uh, others are using this digital service to analyze this kind of data, for example? And then we have the questions of researchers for open science publishing tools. So first of all, what does it mean to publish uh, according to open science principles? So what should I do uh, to, be, to follow them and to make my research more open and more uh, reachable and reusable by other researchers? And are there any best practices for my research communities in my own domain? These are questions that are not very easy to, to answer. And if we look uh, at this from the point of view of the research infrastructure or research initiatives, for example, I do want to know who's using my services, my infrastructure, and I want maybe to use this number in order to present some proofs to to my current and future funders to say, you know, my services are used uh, by many researchers and thanks to my services, they produced these innovative research results. So, and this is why we worked on the Connect services. And here today, you will hear this word connect a lot of times because it's all about connecting things with each other. So. We connect research entities because we will see how we can add context to research results because a publication is just the tip of the iceberg. There are data, software, and there are semantic links between these things. We connect researchers to open science. So we empower communities with open science publishing tools in such a way that it's easy for them to apply open science publishing principles to their daily work. And then we connect the research infrastructures and research initiatives to the scholarly communication life cycle, because the current situation is that uh, the place where the research is, is performed, which are the research infrastructures, and the place where research is published, which is the scholarly communication um, world ecosystem, they are separated, but we want to make them uh, linked. So we want to bridge this gap. How we do this? We do this by building open science gateways, open research gateways for, for the communities. And these are built on top of the open air graph. What is the open air graph? It's an open metadata research graph of interlinked scientific products with access rights information, with links to funders and, and grants and research communities. And when we talk about a graph, we talk about um, a model for representing the world. And in our case, the word is the scholarly communication domain. So we use uh, nodes of the graph to represent uh, objects that can be linked with each other with relationships with the uh, semantics. And you can think of the semantics um, as the reason why these objects are related to each other. So for example, a publication has been funded by a project and the project has been funded by a funder, for example. How do we build the open air research graph? We collect metadata records from um, more than 70 uh, K data sources from all over the world. So not only Europe, but also 
Asia, Africa, and South America and North, and North America. And here in this slide, you can see some numbers. So for more than 400 million uh, records collected, then links, and then also the full text. And these are the full text of open access publications on which we apply full text mining technique in order to extract additional information that is not explicit in the, in the metadata record of, the, of these resources. As you can see, uh, we have many different types of sources, starting from entity registries like uh, Open Door, Retrieve Data, Read IC, then we have the projects from the funders. So one is Cordis for the European uh, projects, but we, we also have uh, national funders like Portuguese funders or the Austrian or the Swiss, the Italian ministry and, and so on. We include the whole Crossref. We, we include the whole the DOIJ, sorry, it's the Directory of Open Access Journals. Uh, we have connection with PLOS, uh, with, with Shallow, which is an important uh, aggregator worldwide, and, and many, many, many others. So what do we do with these uh, massive uh, metadata records that we collect? So we collect the metadata, and then we try to find the duplicates because different records that represent the same um, result, the same entity, uh, need to be merged into one. So we try to find the duplicates, we merge it into one uh, so that we can provide uh, useful statistics at the end of the chain, as, as we will see. We collect the full text and we apply full text mining to enrich uh, the information we already have. We also apply other techniques that exploits the information we have in the metadata in order to infer new properties and links so that we obtain the OpenAI research graph, which is then analyzed for the generation of statistics and is made available in, a, in an index that serves our portals. So OpenAir Explore, OpenAir Connect, and our API, OpenAir Develop, which has um, many, many clients. And the most important, I would say, uh, is the EC participant portal. So every time you use Sigma, you also use uh, one of the open air services that are built on top of the open air research graph. And thanks to the open air research graph, we already addressed two important barriers um, to the open science implementation. And one is the dispersion of research products. As I said at the beginning, they are scattered across sources. Um, but thanks to the graph, we have one place where we can have them all together. And the other barrier is that um, of the focus. So uh, focusing on research literature is really not enough for open science because one of the principles of open science, one of the benefits of open science is that researchers can actually be um, um, assessed, but more importantly, rewarded for all the works that all the work that they do. And it's not about, it's not just about publications. So we have a graph where we have publications, research data and software at the same level. And as you can see here, we also have another um, typology, another research type, which is other research products where we are currently uh, putting, adding the research products that cannot fit uh, the other types. So I think about workflows, protocols, lectures, this kind of objects that cannot be considered uh, neither publications, research data or software. However, this graph is huge. We have more than 100 million research outcomes. So how, to find, how, how can I find those that are relevant for me? And the response 
is the connect services because they are uh, they enable sorry they enable uh, the provision of open science uh, gateway that are a community view of the open air research graph so open air builds the gateway for the community but then it's the community that grows the gateway and we will see how in the next minutes so the open air research graph is analyzed and some criteria are applied in order um, to find the products that are relevant for a specific communities and these rules are provided by gateway creators with which are who are experts in in the field experts of the community so they can provide a list of keywords they can provide a list of relevant projects relevant data sources which can be uh, managed by the infrastructure or thematic they can provide a list of Zenodo communities and the instructions for the open air mining team for the implementation of the algorithm these algorithms will be run on the abstracts and on the full text of open access publication but then automation is not enough it's never enough <laughs> so uh, we give the possibility to researchers that are using the gateway to manually add the research products that are missing and they can do this via the link functionality of the gateway and that you can find also on the explore portal and with that functionality you can add one single product or you can add um, or you can do this in bulk giving a list of dois or by providing an orchid id the last uh, criteria is instead propagation which means that we propagate information from one result to another if there is a strong relationship between the two. So if a community result is supplemented by another research product, then also the latter is added to the gateway because um, it will be relevant for the community as well. So what, we, what can you do with an open research gateway? You can monitor the uptake of open science publishing practices in your communities or research infrastructure. Uh, you can monitor the research impact. You can, you have, you find tools for the reporting to funders. And you can also view the impact of the publications of your communities. It offers um, the possibility to deposit any types of research products, thanks to Zenodo and the network of open air compliant repositories. Of course, it has uh, a single entry point to all research products of your communities. And if you miss one, you can actually link it and grow the content of the gateway. And finally, we have the APIs that you can use to build additional service on top of the open air graph and on top of uh, the research infrastructure. So this is, let's say, a carousel of the functionality I just listed. So the possibility to view statistics and to have reports of the results that you can see in the gateway. And um, of course, you can download the report for the publications, but you also view it uh, from the point of view of the project so given a project you can download uh, a report of its outputs in different ways so as html as csv um, and this is very useful when you have to compile uh, a report for your founder zenodo so if you never heard about zenodo uh, please go on zenodo.org and start using it because you will very easily get a DOI for your research product and you can publish there basically whatever you want if it's of course uh, re related to research. And finally, the search functionality that I'm pretty sure that some of the uh, use cases after, after this presentation will also show uh, 
gives you the, the way to, to discover products that are relevant for you. So uh, not only a simple search by keyword, but also an advanced search and uh, the search uh, by ORCID ID. And um, this is, uh, these are screenshots for the link functionality. So you basically can perform a search and you can find uh, different products from OpenAir, Crossref, Datasite and Orchid. In this case, I search for my name. So I find 12 entries in Orchid so I can, I can select which one uh, I want to input publications. Or I can upload a CSV file of DOIs that must be added to the community. And the API. So you have uh, the dumps of the Open Air Research Graph, and these are, are available also for the community. So you don't need to have the whole uh, Open Air Research Graph. You can download just, um, just the part of it uh, that is interesting for you. And we have the HTTP API to perform uh, search. Then, thanks to the Zenodo API, you can enhance services of the research infrastructure for um, semi-automatic deposition and have uh, the results that are automatically published also on the gateway. And of course, if there are uh, sources, data sources, repositories of the research infrastructures that um, would like to, to contribute to the Open Air Research Graph, they can do it by uh, becoming compliant to our uh, interoperability guidelines and using uh, Open Air Provide. So who stopped worrying and learned to use Connect services? So in the following, we will see some use cases, starting from the one from COVID-19. Then we'll go through Elixir Greece, Daria, Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage, Instruct Eric, Sustainable Development Solution Network, and uh, EPOS Italy. And after that, as Pedro was saying, we will have a carousel of projects that collaborate uh, with Open Air. So, Pedro, uh, would you like to start with the with the questions, or should I go with the COVID nineteen? Co COVID, it's better. COVID, COVID then, then we we'll take cash for questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so while I speak, uh, you can also go to COVID-19, covid-19.openair.eu and uh, have a look at what's in our gateway. And so, and, and the gateway by itself is just one of the many activities that Openair um, started to help researchers in fighting uh, against the epidemic. And basically, there are three lines of activities. So one is to support researchers uh, to publish in a fast way the new research about COVID-19. And we did this by creating and managing with the support uh, of experts a Zenodo community where people can add uh, any type of research products uh, related to COVID-19. The other line of action is to support uh, the discovery of existing research on coronavirus. And the third line is the collaboration with the RDA, COVID-19 Fast Track Working Group, who basically define guidelines in order to um, support the data sharing and data reuse 
on um, on COVID-19 and during the COVID-19 because publishing fast, sharing fast should not mean sharing bad. So here you can see there's another communities that you can find at this link or even easier, you can just go to the main page, to the home page of Zenodo, and you will find a featured community for COVID-19, which yesterday counted 900, more than 900 results of different types. Um, and as I said, it is managed by uh, a mixed team of open air uh, members and experts in the, uh, in the domain. And, and the gateway. So um, when we started to think about this gateway, we say, okay, among the more than 100 million research outcomes that we have in the graph, how do we find the research outcomes that are related to coronavirus? Shall we have a simple search that allows us to identify these products? So, or we should go with a, an advanced search because we have to target specific fields, but which are the fields that are relevant? And which are the search terms that are relevant? C can we do this just with a predefined query or we need to be a little smarter than this? And also, um, especially at the in February, March, there was a plenty, plenty of thematic sources that were uh, built by different communities. So how, how can we be updated? How can we be up to date with these thematic sources? And which one we should include and are uh, indeed relevant? So in order to address our, our doubts and our questions, we use the, the following approach. So first of all, we involved the domain experts. So we made a call for experts among researchers, librarians, research managers, um, in order to find support because in open air, we are not working on disease. <laughs> we are uh, librarians, we are computer scientists, we are uh, many, many things, but not medical doctors. <laughs> so we ask for help. Um, and with this support, we created a public list of data sources, which we keep updated thanks to the suggestion from the communities. And so we created a, a Google form where people can suggest resources. And these include both data sources that we can uh, harvest from open air in order to have the, the resources in the gateway, but also um, websites that are uh, addressing topics in the COVID-19. So then we set up different processes to identify the research outcomes related to coronavirus. So we we have a set of keywords, both uh, free text keywords and keywords from standard classification schemes. We created a full text mining algorithm and we analyze the open air research graph and exploit the existing relationships between publications, data sets and funding projects in order to understand uh, which are uh, the products that talk, let's say, about the coronavirus. And then, of course, we have the manual additional research outcomes thanks to the link functionality. And the last point, the, the, last, uh, the, the last part was the actually setup of the, of, the, of the gateway, the single entry point that you can see now. So in this slide, you will see all, all this uh, summarized in one single slide. So collection and mining, um, 
the additional COVID-19 sources that we found out thanks to the collaboration with the community. Uh, and then there's another uh, COVID-19 community, the gateway that shows the part of the open air research graph that is relevant, and finally, the APIs. Here you, have, you can see some screenshot of, of the community, but I really hope that you already opened the website and you are trying out yourself. So the possibility to, to search for any types of products and you can learn more about the sources and the methodologies and the support in the organization, the creators in the about menu. And of course you can use the faceted search in order to, to drill down your, your search. And this can be done for publications, for data, software, and uh, other research products. And finally, the way you can get the metadata of research products on, on coronavirus. So the JSON dumps that you can find on Zenodo, and you will find the URL the possibility to download the CSV files directly from the uh, directly from the great gateway based on the search you have performed and the API from which you can download uh, the metadata records in XML or in JSON format. And you will have access to this presentation. So if you want to know more, you can follow uh, the links that you can find that you can find here. And of course, you can contact me if you want to know more. Okay, uh, great. Uh, let's let's use now um, two or three minutes to um, uh, to uh, questions. There are already four questions, but we will address three, and then we move to the second second part of this uh, this session. Uh, so, Camila uh, Lindlow ask, uh, this service seems very inclusive. Are you planning to have any control mechanisms in the future or will you trust the community to take care of what are research outputs? So control mechanisms in the way that we work with um, community managers, let's say, to, to ensure uh, quality control of the content. And what do you want to say about that, Alessia? Yes, the, the gateway managers are the curators and can uh, actually define all the criteria and can also reject uh, links that are made by the user. So they can decide that uh, the product that has, that has been linked is in fact not relevant for, for the research uh, communities. Yeah. So, uh... We can you we can have more information directly in the via test if if uh, Alessia or even my colleague Ari want to provide some more input here, but uh, Alessia Bardi, it looks like you have all the information to be able to tell researchers about new publications or projects in their field as soon as they are available. Do do you or someone else have such a service? So. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's the graph uh, have, have a power have uh, lots of powers but uh, <laughs> this is a community effort let's so let's see what do you want to say about this yes that mm, such a service is not in place and it's not in our short-term plan for sure uh, but uh, victor is right i mean we, we we have everything that we need we just need to maybe to plan it and see how we can how we can do this mm -hmm. yeah thank you last question for this um, block a keyword search does not uh, work well in my field uh, homogenization a specific field also journals are not very informative as we are just a small field um, is anyone working on building such communities based on initial lists of publications where authors and references can show clear what belongs together? You, you can already, I think, tell us something about the way that uh, we organize the content. I think the COVID is a good example, but we will have more examples in the coming use cases, but maybe you can explain a bit 
how it works and um, this uh, this um, yeah, yes yes because i'm to let's say bootstrap um, a community gateway uh, what we victor says is exactly what we do so we start by asking um, the community which are the uh, say the, the projects that that are relevant for the community, which are the list of sources that are relevant. So if there are specific journals to include, and also we can add specific, uh, a specific list of publications as a start. And this is very useful, for example, also for the mining, be because um, if the mining starts uh, by analyzing publications that for sure are related to the community, uh, the level of precision and recall that it reaches is, is much higher. Okay, so now it's time to, so you can also provide more input if you think that um, uh, you find something more to say in the chat, uh, Alessia, but uh, I think it, we have answered these uh, three first questions. Um, we will uh, address other questions in the future also about with this, uh, Washington is already here asking also, but let's move to the second part. At the end of these six presentations, we will uh, have time for questions and answers. So please comment in the chat or write it in the Q&A uh, directly to the speakers. Um, Alessia, do you want to do an introduction or can I ask uh, Tanasis to, to join us for this first presentation. So we will have six use cases and we start with the uh, Elixir Greece, uh, Thanasis uh, Vergulis from, from Athena Research and Innovation Center and uh, also representing Elixir uh, Greece. So you can present yourself and, uh, and have the, the presentations. We want to have a kind of presentation seven, eight minutes in order to find time at the end to, for discussion and for questions. So, Danasis, you can share your, your screen. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, perfect with the sound, okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm Thanas Vergulis, uh, Scientific Associate uh, at the Athena Research Center in Greece and uh, a member of the Elixir uh, Greece community. And uh, before we start talking, uh, let me explain uh, what Elixir Greece is. Uh, Elixir Greece uh, is the Greek node of uh, the Elixir uh, S3 European research, research Infrastructure. Uh, this is a research infrastructure uh, that counts uh, uh, nodes uh, in almost uh, any European uh, country. And it is about uh, bioinformatics and life sciences. And uh, the Greek node uh, contains, uh, consists of uh, about 15 members, uh, research centers and uh, um, uh, universities uh, that have groups uh, that are very active in the field of uh, bioinformatics and life sciences. And um, uh, this community uh, was uh, selected as a use case uh, for the uh, open air advance uh, open air connect uh, uh, platform and um, uh, the result was uh, uh, the bootstrapping and uh, the customization uh, of uh, the dashboard for the greek node this is what i'm showing right right now uh, in my screen um, the the first stage uh, was uh, to collect to gather uh, information that was relevant uh, to the people of the Greek node. And this was done uh, both uh, by uh, providing uh, an initial list of uh, publications uh, uh, that have been produced by these people, and also uh, by using text mining techniques uh, in the open air uh, data. And um, uh, also, uh, we had to provide uh, a list of a list of official 
uh, acknowledgements, uh, acknowledgement uh, statements that uh, uh, the people in the community are using uh, when uh, they publish uh, research that is relevant to the projects uh, that uh, fund this uh, community. So uh, we, we had, uh, at first we had to collect uh, publications and uh, software tools uh, of these people and provide an initial list and then uh, identify uh, those text mining rules uh, that uh, could uh, uh, include in this uh, dashboard um, even more results. And this was done uh, with the core text mining team of uh, the open air with their collaboration. And um, the result was uh, uh, the content uh, in this dashboard. Um, in addition to that, uh, we, uh, we had some extra uh, requirements. Uh, for example, uh, since uh, 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 members of, of this community uh, had uh, uh, had an, um, a previous experience uh, using a couple of uh, uh, indicators for scientific impact, uh, we tried to integrate uh, the scores based on these uh, uh, indicators in the interface of uh, this dashboard. And you can see this, uh, it was implemented uh, by adding uh, two uh, buttons uh, in each of the publications record uh, that uh, uh, after clicking on them, uh, someone can uh, uh, gather information about uh, how uh, popular or how influential is its article. Uh, these two scores are based on a particular citation-based uh, analysis uh, algorithms, uh, each of them capturing a different aspect of uh, uh, scientific impact. And uh, after clicking uh, uh, on this uh, pop-up uh, uh, bottom someone uh, can see also some uh, visualizations or, or some details about uh, the particular publication and um, uh, also uh, there is a color code uh, if uh, the button is gray then uh, this means that uh, this uh, publication uh, is not uh, uh, exceptional in in the uh, context of influence or uh, popularity, uh, but uh, if uh, the color is uh, green, then uh, this is uh, uh, an indicator that uh, the article is very popular. And um, uh, more or less, uh, after additions like uh, these, uh, the, the platform was ready uh, to be presented to the members of the LXRGR community. And uh, um, a couple of months ago, uh, Alessia uh, presented uh, the functionalities of the gateway uh, to the members of the LXGR community. Uh, this was a training event uh, due to the COVID-19 situation. It was an online uh, training event uh, that was co-organized uh, uh, by RDA and uh, LXGR and Open Air. Uh, it was a broader event uh, about uh, open science, uh, but uh, it had also uh, a dedicated session uh, for the presentation of uh, uh, the gateway. And uh, I think that the participation was uh, uh, re really uh, good and uh, the members of the community uh, the, the, the final version of uh, the gateway was presented to the members of the community. And uh, before I close, uh, let me uh, say a couple of uh, words about uh, the next steps. Uh, first of all, uh, we are ready to discuss uh, uh, and to help to assist if uh, there is the need uh, that these in indicators will be included to other gateways as well. And uh, also, uh, 
uh, in the context of another uh, uh, project, uh, we work uh, for the LXFGR community. Uh, we will try uh, to, to add in the next uh, few months uh, a connection between the official uh, platform uh, for uh, on-demand computations uh, that, that uh, uh, this community provides to its members. This is a cloud infrastructure that any uh, scientist can run uh, her uh, experiments, uh, computational experiments. And uh, we will provide a connection uh, because we will uh, add the functionality that the scientist can uh, define uh, her own um, uh, research objects, which is something like an experiment that contains uh, a package that contains uh, the code, uh, the data, and the configuration, and maybe also the publication. And this, uh, we will try to list them in the dashboard as well. Uh, that's from me. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank many you. thanks. Many thanks. Um, so let's move to the second uh, uh, use case. So, Erzebet, if you if you want, you can uh, start sharing your screen. Uh, we will have a um, presentation from the, the Daria Open Science Officer um, about the way that Daria EU is in fact interacting with uh, with Open Air. So, uh, please share your screen. Let's start, and then we will have after the six use cases, we will have questions and and answer. Okay, I can see. I can see your slides. Um, share, share also your, your share also Sorry, your camera. Sorry, I needed to. Yes, yes, yes. I needed to unmute. I would unmute myself first, and uh, yeah, I'm sharing my. It's screen. okay. I can hear you. Yes, and sorry, maybe I just quickly uh, move to another room. It's one second. Which one? No. Oh, okay. Just give me one second. Which one? This one? Okay. Okay. So, sorry for this inconvenience. No, no, no it's problem, it's problem. a it's a COVID use case, but so <laughs> now I can. <laughs> it's a genuine one. Now I can I can uh, okay. share my screen with you and now. You should see. So uh, let me just switch to presentation mode. And so hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us for this session. I'm Erzsébet Tocifra, and I'm representing Daria. Daria is uh, pretty much the equivalent of Elixir. It's the same type of European research infrastructure, but in another uh, disciplinary field that is uh, arts and humanities, especially what we call digital humanities. And so- Do you think you can share your uh, camera? No, if, if, if no, uh, no My problem. camera, well, uh, yeah. No problem, no problem. Uh, wait, let's, wait, let's... wait. Uh, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Hmm. Yeah. Hold so on, I... but go ahead, I'll try to fix this. Okay, perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay, just let me know when I should switch it on, or you know what, now I'm able to do this. Yeah, after all the room changing and the video issues and everything, sorry, we can get started. I will be uh, quick and efficient. So yes, now you should perfect, see perfect. both so we can, my it's better now that, uh, face and faces yeah, and the voice. Absolutely, okay. I truly Thank believe you. that, like as a humanist, especially more. So um, so Daria is the research infrastructure, European Research Infrastructure Consortium for Arts and Humanities. And uh, we were super glad to have the chance to collaborate with uh, Open Air on making all kinds of research uh, research uh, outputs visible, because the challenges that Alessia mentioned at the beginning, uh, like uh, um, the fragmentation of, of research outputs across the web, across publishers, across repositories, uh, some of them are still sitting in our computers, uh, is even more an issue with the humanities, especially so because uh, we don't have really uh, domain specific databases. There is no humanities equivalent of PubMed. That is no really humanities equivalent of archive. Um, so 
um, the, the, the outputs of, uh, of our research is uh, even more, if you know, hidden, like even we have difficulties, uh, much, more, uh, much more serious difficulties to find and access and reuse the different content. Uh, also because uh, these are happening in smaller contexts, in smaller journals, in smaller repositories, multilingual ones. So yeah, we have serious uh, discovery uh, and reusability challenges. And so um, unsurprisingly, these challenges that uh, are domain specific, arts and humanities specific are of course reflected in the smaller context of Daria as well. So it's not an easy task to you know, keep track of all the Daria affiliated um, research outputs, all the content coming from our repositories, all the publications when Daria is mentioned. Uh, so we found it especially exciting to, uh, to uh, uh, have the chance to build something that goes against this and lay the grounds of an information management system that goes beyond the scope of publications because we also see that research data, research software will not be uh, properly evaluated, will not be properly um, um, assessed and rewarded by academic tenure promotion criteria unless they are visible in an information management system, unless people can sufficiently include them into the CV, put in a discovery environment along with the publications. So, um, so we were super uh, enthusiastic to see the solution of the Open Air Research Community Dashboard. And so we wanted to um, build a discovery environment that is inclusive with a variety of content types that are important for arts and humanities scholarship, but are typically ex excluded from, you know, this typical bi bibliometric databases. So what we did, uh, I quickly uh, take you through um, like uh, how we populated uh, the Daria um, uh, research community dashboard. I forgot to tell you like daria.openair.eu, you can uh, go there and visit, but um, uh, it's still under construction. Um, the serious volumes of content uh, are about to be added in the coming days. So. Um, I would suggest you to take a look now and uh, take a second look a week later, so to say. Um, so what we did is that um, at my organization, Daria, we have quite strong open access policies and we don't only, you know, preach about open access and how to do this, but also, um, also um, um, uh, give infrastructural components to really uh, realize this. So we have a we have a um, Daria collection on the French Hall repository, and we also have a Daria collection on Zenodo on the Zenodo repository that uh, Alessia already mentioned. So in populating the uh, Open Air Daria Community Gateway, uh, it was the very first step to find these collections, start mining these collections mining them for Daria content and add the content to the dashboard. The second step was a little bit more data oriented. We wanted to do this pilot with two flagship Daria data services, the French Social Sciences and Humanities uh, data repository Nakala and the German uh, repository TextGrid and uh, build interoperability frameworks uh, with the open air system so that open air can harvest them and can add them to the um, to the community dashboard, the Daria uh, open air uh, research community dashboard. Um, it was a very interesting exercise and I think it's super important to organize uh, these discovery frameworks, not only nationally, but also thematically and address domain specific challenges that we have, for instance, developing this metadata crosswalks. So what you can expect to lend in the Daria uh, Open Air uh, uh, Research Community Dashboard in the coming days is uh, humanities data at its finest. You may wonder what is this? It's images, it's uh, digital critical editions, it's uh, newspaper collections, it's uh, 
encodings of different shorts, it's encoded musical sheets, for instance. So very diverse and very interesting uh, content that will be visible uh, in the dashboard as research data. Um, and the first step, first step uh, we also wanted to um, um, be this dashboard, uh, also wanted this dashboard to be compliant with our internal publication monitoring system. So to the extent we have a Zotero library that queries all the publications indexed by uh, Google Scholar where Daria appears. So um, all these publications lent in a Zotero collection. And after a bit of a manual, semi-automated, half manual, half automated curation, we select the really, truly Daria affiliated ones. And we also started to add these publications uh, to the uh, Open Air Daria dashboard. So on the long run, it's also gonna be fully compliant and visible and searchable and enrichable in the dashboard. Um, so, what we learned to tell you a little bit of our experiences uh, working with OpenAir. Um, the first one is probably the most important one. It's super important if you want to be open, open science and open science discovery frameworks to be inclusive with all disciplines. Um, this is a challenge to do, but this is a challenge first to do because Open science is not enough to be open, but all the disciplines should be there. It should be equally open, equally inclusive with all knowledge areas. And uh, this is why we are super grateful to have um, humanity scholarship uh, on board um, in the gateway and in the uh, bigger part of the uh, open air uh, research graph. Um, building metadata crosswalks, it's not as one directional process is one would imagine. It's not about um, the developers of these data services just set up a crosswalk and that's it. So it was super important for us to have, a, and still is, to have a, a support team who helps us from the open air team and uh, they can back and forth and uh, align and then realign and then realign. So if we are building bridges between smaller and bigger systems, smaller and bigger, uh, uh, data services, then people need to stand and, you know, collaborate from both ends of this bridge. And uh, it was really nice that uh, we, we uh, got this support from OpenAir in the framework of a funded project. Uh, what else? Yeah, interoperability is like a translation. So we are using common denominators, which means that, of course, a certain nitty gritty, certain richness of the original content will necessarily get lost in translation. And this is why we found it really important that open air is super uh, transparent about provenance information. Like there is a clear, uh, it's very clearly displayed where the content is coming from, uh, what was the last update, um, linking back to the original hosting and so on. So I think that's it uh, from uh, my side, uh, maybe um, a little bit of, um, of a practical update next week, we are going to introduce the dashboard to the open air community. So if you want to learn more, uh, you are very welcome to join us. And uh, we are also going to publish a little bit more detailed uh, case study uh, soon. So thanks a lot. Yeah, great, many thanks. And also thank you for sharing this also invitation at the end. Um, so questions um, to help but so you can put it in the question question and answer so let's move to a third presentation Alessia you don't you you don't need eight minutes so you can start already so let's move to the Alessia is here representing digital humanities and cultural heritage um, as they were not available to do this presentation at this time so Alessia yes I, I will briefly uh... Uh, show the digital humanities and cultural heritage gateway that we have set up. And um, I really like the idea of presenting this after the diary presentation because uh, as it presented uh, the digital humanities context from the infrastructure point of view, but then Daria um, 
it's just a part of the content that is available in the Digital Humanities Gateway, which is indeed uh, a thematic gateway, which now shows more than 5 million publications. So, and this tells you how much active is the Digital Humanities um, researcher, uh, research community. And um, in fact, here we still, we still miss the Nakala and text with content, which will uh, further nourish the, this gateway. And here you, you can see a part of the configuration that we used, um, thanks to the suggestion of Achille Felicetti from, from PIN, which is the main, the main creator of, of this gateway. So we have a list of projects from several funders, from the European Commission uh, to the Italian Ministry, uh, the old RC UK, um, Australian funders, and, and many others will have to be added. Um, the main content providers that have been selected for now are the Archaeology Data Service and some journals uh, that were selected by by Achille and his collaborator, and finally 20 uh, Zenodo communities that we could identify as relevant for the domain. Uh, we did a, a lot of work on the subjects, um, which really helps us at identifying, for example, interesting connection between uh, cultural heritage and marine science because of the vessels that are underwater and that are interesting for, from both point of view, from the point of view of history and from the point of view of marine science and how um, you know, the fishes and all these things uh, grow in, in the old vessels under the sea. So as I said, this uh, uh, a work in progress. I mean, it's already uh, a production gateway, but it can be further improved. So we started it during the Open Air Connect project uh, with PIN, P-I-N, from the uh, University of Florence. And we are continuing, we are enhancing the configuration in the context of the Ariadne Glass project, with our, which is um, an infrastructure for archaeological research. And you will learn more about this uh, afterwards in the session dedicated to the collaboration with projects. And this ends the brief of, overview about the digital humanities and cultural heritage gateway. So I think we give the floor to the next speaker. Yes. Who is Claudia? Claudia. For, for instance, Eric. Okay, thank you, Alessia. Let's move. Okay. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Can you, you can present you yourself. Are? Yeah, thank you. Hi. Then, uh, my name is Claudia Leno Amaro. I am the senior program manager for Instrac Eric. Instrac Eric is the European Research Infrastructure for Structural Biology. We are a distributed research infrastructure. We are a landmark S3 research infrastructure. And I know these are a lot of acronyms. So if anybody has any question about what any of this mean, please, please ask me. But one important uh, point of that, all of that description is that Instrac is a distributed research infrastructure. And what it means with this is that Instra have 10 different Instra centers around Europe with 23 facilities. These facilities can be visited or samples can be sent and uh, accessed remotely from all the scientists in all our member countries. We have 15 members, 14 countries plus EMBL, and all the researchers can openly use our infrastructure and get funding to visit for travel costs, for sample shipping, and also for the equipment consumables, all the needs from to do your experiments. But that's not 
this is our main activity to provide this research visit or remote access, but we also uh, have activities in R&D funding, training, internships, and you can read all about this in our website. Then I'm going to rush a little bit through this, then we have more opportunities for questions. Then I want to just to show you the sort of equipment I'm talking about, what is in our catalog, because the state-of-the-art equipment that we offer does translate in high-profile publications. We have thousands of publications already, and this for us is our most important uh, KPI, is the way that we like to represent our output the best. Then this is a very important point for us. Then, how we do this? Uh, what do we need of this publication library? What we need is to identify and collect all the publications that acknowledge Instracaric. But not only the publications, we also need to mine the publication metadata, what the paper relate to which project, which country, which funders, with, who, with, with uh, which collaborators. Then another point of interest to us is that we would like to link Instracary publications to the data repository. We take fair data very seriously in Instract. And this point to be able to link publications to data repositories is a very important part of that plan. And what do we do with this information? We use this information for reporting, reporting to the commission, reporting to ESFRI, reporting to our national funders, and also reporting to this, our scientific community. We also use this information for communication. We pick highlights from the publications and we show scientists, this is what is available to you. Please come and use, and use our infrastructure. And we also use it for service optimization. We have a look at what works, what doesn't, and keep our catalog up to date and always improving. Then, let's, if we go point by point, the first point is how we identify and make this list of publications. And this is the, how we do it at the moment. We do it manually. We ask in, when a person uh, uh, up, upload their proposal in our system, but as part of the term and conditions is that they acknowledge Instract involvement with this, sen with this sentence that has Instract edit in it. And then manually we search Web of Science or PubMed or Google search, either for Instracaric to look for all the papers that have acknowledged Instracaric. And then we have to manually verify each publication. Why do we have to do that? Because we have a lot of false positive and false negatives that we need to try to avoid. In Web of Science, for example, we pick a, a a publication that have acknowledged instruct either in the funding, in the funders or the acknowledgement. But if there is no funder uh, field, it goes to the acknowledgement. But if there is both funder field and acknowledgement, only look at the funders field. Then if our researcher had by mistake put our funding in acknowledgement, this is a false negative. And in PubMed and Google search, we get false positives. If we, if we were to look for Instract, we will get hundreds of thousands of publications. Then we only can put Instract Eric. In, and in that point, we miss some of our publications. These just are a few examples in green of the things we want to count and in red of the things we don't want to count. The first one in the top left is a perfect example of what we want. The user have acknowledged instruct and has tell us what is the proposal ID uh, that relates to the publication and we can uh, advertise this properly. However, the other two green have used only instruct, not instruct edits, then it can be missing some of the searches. And the ones in red 
are cases of other Horizon 2020 projects that have instruct in the name, then this can give you false positives. Then what has been our collaboration with open air? We see open air as a possibility to improve our mining of our publications. What are the advantages we see of using open air? The advantages we see are the public, the, the email publication for a larger number of sources that we do. Then this will make sure that we lose less publications. They also have a detailed mining algorithm that will help them pick the right publications. In the last few years, we have been working together with open air to improve this mining algorithm. We have shared with open air our manual uh, mining of the literature and they have shared their mining results and we have been working to improve from both sides. We also see an, as a great advantage the metadata mining options that uh, open air provide with projects, with countries, with funders. We see it uh, as it was mentioned before by another panelist, the transparency part of it, using an independent resource to produce a KPI, we see it as a great advantage. And obviously, as you can imagine, the time saving element. This is a very time consuming to do it manually, then using open air will be great. But there are still challenges that we face. We need to make sure that the mining algorithm avoid, ident avoid false positives and false negatives. And I want to give you just one example of this. It's great for us that we can look for the result of the projects we are involved in. This is a collection of projects we are, we are involved in. But not all the results coming from those projects involve instracary resources. Some do, but some of the publications are from our partners, are not instracary work. Then this needs still some work to, be made, to make sure that we are not counting publications that don't really relate to us. Again, it's great for us that we can look at and filter for countries, for funders, for communities. We haven't found, and maybe this is us and we will appreciate very much your input. We haven't found a way to extract this information properly to then, we see it in the, in the site, but we want to be able to export it to be able to present it to our funders in a, in a different way. And we are looking into this and we, we are still look, working on that. Another element that is crucial for Instruct and that will be great to work together in is that we want, is, is a open air gives us the opportunity to see that some of our publications link to data repositories like the PDB. But still there is no filter option to just select the publications with those links. That will be of great help to us because we want to, uh, to encourage our users, again, because this relates to fair data. And uh, finally, I would like to, to acknowledge the, the work, the collaborative work that uh, our team in Instruct and the Open Air team has done together in the last few years to go improve our mining of the publications that is so crucial for uh, th uh, those projects. And I would like to use this uh, last slide to show you how important it is to these KPIs to be able to mine them uh, automatically and not manually. It say, there it says that we have 958 publications. That was true when we did these slides. We have over 1100 publications now, and that has not been updated because it's done manually. Then this is a, of great importance to us, and we are really looking forward to future collaborations. Claudia, thank you very much. Great presentation, thank you very much. Um, so let's let's move to the, so just to, just to tell you that we have two more use cases, we are, managing quite well the time. So EPUS, now and then the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, so Michele, uh, Michele, you can, um, Michele Manunta, 
uh, representing here EPUS. Uh, you can. Hi, Pedro. Since you Hi, I'm Michele. You can share your screen. Yeah. Can you perfect. see my screen? Perfect, perfect. Okay. okay thank, thank you. You, you can right present on. yourself. Thank you. Okay, for the introduction. So I'm a researcher of CNR in Italy, and I work in um, the development of algorithm for processing uh, satellite data and uh, to retrieve information about our our planet. Um, uh, within EPOS, I'm the coordinator of the space segment of the EPOS research infrastructure. And uh, in particular, I'm the coordinator of the thematic core service satellite data. So let's start just with a few words about EPOS. EPOS is a pan-European research infrastructure in the context of solid earth science. In particular, EPOS aims at to um, sharing and providing access to the facilities that have been built in Europe in the uh, solid earth science. In particular, we want to uh, provide a single, distribute, a single access to the distributed research infrastructure that uh, we have in Europe in Europe, so the users can access to the data, to the product, to the processing service, also and also to the software that uh, has been, uh, let me say, uh, built and developed in Europe in, the, in this context. EPOS involve um, 25 countries. We have uh, several uh, international organizations. We have uh, um, almost uh, 250 national research infrastructure and thousands and thousands of uh, instruments and laboratories and uh, terabytes of data and so on. EPOS is organized in communities. Uh, we refer to each community as a thematic core service, TCS. So we have the community of the seismologists, we have the volcanic observatories, GPS data, um, near fault observation. And one of these community is the satellite data uh, community. So the TCS satellite data. Uh, the TCS uh, satellite data works in strong cooperation with the, the European space agencies. So space agency, so we can benefit from the support of the of visa. In particular, um, our uh, let me say gateway uh, access point is based on the Joaz exploitation platform that is a, a cloud-based platform um, developed thanks to the help of ESA. Um, within the, the um, Joaz exploitation platform, the user can navigate, can uh, to search data, product, and uh, processing tools. But most important for us is that uh, the uh, the JEP, uh, JEP is the acronym for Jazz Exploitation Platform, is uh, or provide machine-to-machine uh, uh, -machine, um, procedures, so, so API, mainly based on, on OGC uh, standard and procedures. So the, the, the JEP platform is directly connected to uh, the EPOS central hub. So the user accessing to EPOS can access to our data, our product, and can integrate integrate uh, the satellite product also with uh, the other communities product uh, with uh, seismological uh, information, with uh, uh, GPS information and so on. It is the, 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 in my opinion, the most important idea uh, of EPO. So, so uh, to integrate uh, data and product coming from uh, uh, different commu uh, scientific uh, community. Um, within uh, our uh, TCS, we can provide or, or the research in infrastructure provide a systematic process. So we provide um, data and product, but also we implemented uh, on demand processing tool so the user can um, uh, um, through the JPEG and access to a web tool to process uh, directly process the uh, satellite uh, data set. So <clears throat> which kind of data we are going to, to, to share and to distribute to, to EPOS. Our um, information, our product are mainly based on Copernicus uh, data. <clears throat> 
and in particular, we work with the radar uh, satellite images. And uh, thanks to the um, interferometry uh, SAR technology, we can measure, we can detect and map uh, surface deformation that uh, affect the, our planet with uh, centimeter to millimeter accuracy. One of the most important um, application is uh, uh, related to the earthquake uh, events. So in case of an earthquake event, we can uh, map the um, centimetric deformation that has been uh, produced, generated by the seismic event. In this slide, we have some example relevant to some um, seismic events that occurred between uh, 2017 and 2019 in, uh, in the world. And uh, this data can be, so this uh, information about the, the, the surface can be easily integra integrated with uh, the information coming from other uh, community, uh, communities and uh, allows the users to, to study the dynamic that uh, um, uh, drives our, our planet. But uh, uh, benefiting from a large data set, we, we can study not only single event, um, such, um, as in the case of uh, uh, earthquakes, but we can uh, um, analyze the temporal behavior of surface uh, deformation. In this case, I'm showing you the mean deformation velocity map relevant to the Europe uh, territory. Uh, in this case, we can uh, study and follow the temporal behavior of several kinds of deformation. For example, here we have uh, some plots uh, from, the, from the top in the clockwise directions. Uh, we have uh, direction, we have the uh, two mines uh, on the top where we detect more than um, 40 centimeters of total deformation. Then we have a landslide on, on the right uh, relevant to the Black Sea. And then on the bottom, we have an earthquake on the right, uh, relevant to the left Cada Island, and the Campi Flegre Caldera, that is one of the most important volcanoes in Europe and uh, is uh, very close uh, to my institute where I'm, I'm now. So we are located just in the middle of, of an important active volcano in, in Italy. And then uh, on the left, we have some uh, um, uh, human uh, um, or human related effect because they are seasonal and they are referred to as uh, um, aquifer exploitation and uh, under, underground uh, uh, gas storage. So these deformations are relevant to uh, human activities. So they are very important for the impact that they can, they can have on our um, security. But as already said, uh, we, uh, within EPOS, we are uh, distributing also uh, processing tools. So the user can access and uh, can navigate in the uh, web, uh, in the um, job browser, can select an area, uh, analyze the available uh, data set. Of, of course, I'm speaking about uh, satellite images and select a data set and process, directly process this data set in, uh, within our infrastructure. Here we have an example relevant to the um, uh, Bruxelles uh, region. And uh, the user, so in this case, can provide the process, can access to processing uh, on demand. And this is the, the context where we uh, establish a cooperation between EPOS, so the Satellite Data Thematic Core Service, and the Open Island uh, um, Initiative project. In particular, we modified the, the, um, the workflow of our processing tool in order to include uh, um, the possibility for the users uh, once they have produced the data, so they have processed the data, to publish this data within uh, the Zenodo platform. And we include the, let me say, the, the, publishing, uh, the publishing step. It's important that this step is totally transparent for the users. So the users don't need to create a, a, an account uh, within Zenodo. 
but they need just to uh, provide some information relevant to the metadata, for example, the owner of the, um, uh, of, of the product, a short abstract or the disinformation relevant, some information relevant to the institution, and they uh, can um, public and make a, a available for the community, the results uh, in, the, in the Zenodo uh, platform. In this way, we, uh, the user can share the, the science. Uh, if, uh, for example, if they are going to publish uh, the, the data set in some papers or in, uh, in the project and so on. It's important, in my opinion, that um, the, the data are, the data set are directly published in a EPOS community within uh, Zenodo, and the procedure is uh, really uh, transparent for, uh, for the users. Of course, the, then we have the, the retrieval of the data set that are published within Zenodo within OpenIRA. So in OpenIRA, we have the EPOS community dashboard where we can recognize uh, publication software and also uh, research data set. In this way, uh, we can follow, of course, the, the, the impact of the um, or the activities of the, of the users, of the scientists uh, in the community uh, by recognized um, publication and, and so on. So um, this was my last slide. Okay. If there are questions, I'm happy to, to answer. Perfect, so many thanks. Um, let, let's move to the, to the last presentation. Uh, Okay, uh, Achilles here is already connected. Achilles, um, representing here the, the use case of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Can you start sharing your screen? Can you? Yes. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So this is the last use case. Then I, I already saw that several people are asking and they we are providing the answers, but you can also ask questions and we will answer after this presentation. Achilles, yes. the floor is yours. Pedro. Yes. And okay. After Achilles, there is also Harris from Matina Research Center that will talk, uh, talk us about the sustainable development goals in the yeah. open infrastructure. Okay. okay, so I start. Yes, uh, if you want to share your camera also, it will be better. Uh, I'm sharing, but, perfect, perfect. Uh, now you can, you can okay, start. Thank you. Good. Great. So, on my side, my name is Achilles Vasilopoulos, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Ioannina. And I'm also a senior researcher at iCreate, which actually was the partner of Open Air Connect. And it's also one of the hosts of the Sustainable Development Solutions Networks uh, network for for which I'm going to talk to you about today and our work in Open Air Connect. So the Sustainable Solutions um, Network is all about the SDGs. It's a network, as the name says, a network of networks actually that has to do with the sustainable development goals and the sustainable development goals are uh, what the united nations has set up as the main goals of humanity for 2030 it's the actually the the, the dashboard that um presents everything that needs to be done by 2030 as the united nations things uh, so as you can see in the slide, there is a wide variety of, of targets, no poverty, zero hunger, reduced inequalities, etc., etc. So it's a very broad agenda, and it was actually the main change between the, the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals, because the Millennium, Sustainable, uh, the Millennium Development Goals uh, were targeted mainly on the developing countries while the Sustainable Development Goals are targeted to all countries, developed and developing. Um, so the SDG agenda has these 17 targets, that, 17 goals that are 
can be broken down to 169 targets and even more to 230 indicators. One of these indicators, and there's a reason why I'm, I'm saying that, is research done on, on each of these um, 17 goals. So as the uh, Ban Ki-moon, the, uh, the UN general uh, said it when the sustainable development goals were presented, is that the Agenda 2030 compels us to look beyond national boundaries and short-term interests. However, to implement the Sustainable Solution Agenda, the, the idea was that we need a network that will be both global, but also will have local hubs who will be responsible to guide the, the local authorities, but also to observe research and what is done in this, uh, in this framework. So the, the SDSN was set up in 2012 by uh, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. It, it was meant to mobilize global scientific and technological expertise. Uh, and to support the SDGs at the local, national, and global scales. This is why I said before that SDSN is a network of networks, because there's a big network, the, the SDSN Global, and then we have national and local, local networks, like SDSN Greece at the local level, but also regional ones like SDSN Europe. And they all collaborate to, to um, target uh, to, to, uh, the specific targets. So more than 20 national and regional SDSNs are already launched. And SDSN Greece was uh, one of the first to, to do so. We were very happy to be engaged and to host the SDSN Greece. And we have more than 30, uh, 350 member institutions over 80 countries. This is our website. So feel free to browse and, and have a look at our work and what we are doing in terms of, of achieving the sustainable development goals. And uh, the UN SDSN Greece is part of a cluster of institutions here in Greece, including the uh, European uh, Innovation and Technology Climate Kick, the RISIS uh, Research Center that is uh, based on the Athens University of Economics and Business. And it is doing research on socioeconomic and environmental sustainability over many years now. And the Climate Kick, which is um, the Athena Research and Innovation Center, is the, the host and is led by the director, is Professor Phoebe Kuduri, and is also um, one of the hosts of UNSDSN. So far, uh, you, the SDSN Greece uh, has more than 50 public and private universities as partners. NGOs, we have strategic partners like Ministry of Environment, WWF Greece, uh, Greece uh, Greek National Research Center, and we have collaboration with critical strategic partners. So what was the idea behind um, us getting involved in Open Air Connect? Uh, we wanted to create as, as the, the, the reason for SDSN to exist uh, is to create a hub for all the research conducted in the local boundaries. So all the projects and all the, um, the papers that are um, related to sustainable development in Greece. And we wanted to create this platform, this repository that everything will be collected. So this is the, the research style to of, um, and this is our, our community, the community dashboard, uh, where we already have 9,800 publications and many research data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, you know, it sounds huge and it has a reason for that. This is because as you saw in the SDG dashboard, the SDGs are pretty much about everything. So uh, our work here was to collect uh, publications, data, and relevant documents about all the research conducted in Greece and put it in this repository. 
but the most important work, and, and this is where Open Air Connect came as a, as a lifesaver, is to be able to search within this uh, research, monitor how the, the country is going, and link uh, research outputs to specific European projects or European or funding uh, agents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is also, and this is very important in order to monitor because, as I said, STSN uh, has this role to monitor how the country is doing in the several um, SDGs. But also, um, it's about having the the role of the local hub, so being able to identify who is doing what in Greece. And this is actually our main work and, and the main development of SDSN Greece, uh, the, the dashboard right now, is to um, find ways to extract information for publication from um, institutions, from authors, and be able to have them within each of these 17 goals. This will help in, this will be of great help in two ways. First, because uh, this is going to be a repository where everyone can uh, get in and find out what he wants in terms of um, each of these goals. But second, it's very important for us because at the beginning, when we started this, uh, the, joining the SDSN community, and we were trying to manually identify who is doing what in Greece, we found out that this is an impossible task. So doing it not manually, but automatically, well, with a bit of supervision, let's say, and with a bit of placing rules here and there um, is of great help. And it's also a very important um, for SDSN in general, because uh, every now and then we have uh, the SDSN dashboard so we provide data uh, at US SDSN Global uh, saying what, how the country is doing in each of these 17 goals. And as I said before, one of these how the country is doing is how much research is done in each of these um, goals. And this, is, this will be very easy for us to collect when we have the, um, the dashboard fully developed. And how do we do that? We are trying to um, populate a, a list of keywords for each SDG. It's not easy, so we're trying hard. And we are um, putting more and more every time. And this is how the, the, um, the different publications and the different projects will be categorized. And then the, how the information, like authors, like universities, like recent centers will be extracted. So we can have this um, this greater overview, this great overview of everything that is going on in Greece, and and be able to understand who is doing what. And uh, this is um, related to what we say as sub communities. So each SDG will be a different um, sub community, let's say, where it will have the very active partners, the very active. Uh, uh, researchers, the very active uh, institutions, and uh, they're not so active in this field. And of course, this will be useful for us to, to actually be able to have all the relevant information for our network in Greece, but also for uh, everyone else who will access the dashboard, like the policymakers, scientists, other scientists, etc. So that was it for my part. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer at the end. Okay, great. So let's join now, now all the, um, all the, um, let's use uh, three minutes and then we have no, 15 Pedro. minutes. Pedro, no? we, we have a uh, final Harris, presentation I, from I, Harris. Harris. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Harris, sorry, very much. Sorry. Hello. Hello. Hi, Harry. Hey, Harry. Okay, Thanks. we can see you. 
Yeah. Okay, thanks for having me and for the invitation to, to the Open Air Assembly, General Assembly. Uh, I'm Harris Papagiorgiou, coming from Athena Research Center and from the Institute for Language and Speech Processing. I'm a research director in the Institute and I have been working in artificial intelligence and language technology, speech and language uh, for the last three decades. And uh, I'm very keen on uh, using these technologies in various uh, areas, in various domains. We had, uh, and and uh, definitely for SDGs, which I will uh, briefly present our developments for SDGs and how we plan, how we try to bridge open air research outputs to SDGs. May I share my screen? Please do, please do. Yep. Do um, you see my screen? Perfect, perfect. Let's, you can put in presenter mode. Okay, uh, briefly about the, 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 the tracking SDG developments and uh, as I said, how to connect open air findings, open air research outputs, data sets, publications, projects, and various uh, entities like the beneficiaries, organizations, and uh, the, the research labs and the universities that have participated in the projects and uh, bringing various facets and aspects like uh, visualizations per country or per funder, per, per, per program and, and in the timeline across time <clears throat> so uh, the, uh, we see this this problem this task in uh, as a three step process as a, in three different discrete phases the first step is how to classify all these research outputs according to, to sdgs the second is about how to to bring evidence about the innovations uh, and the outputs of these uh, open air research outputs uh, in related to to sdgs and what might be or is today the impact of these innovations in terms of the of the indicators in uh, in sustainable development goals Goals. The methodology is a uh, human in the loop approach where we, we, we integrate uh, technologies, artificial intelligence technologies in an efficient and effective way in the open air graph. It is granular and scalable. It can process uh, thousands of, of research outputs and it is ap applicable to, to, to all SDGs. So the first phase about SDG classification, the usual suspects here is that we have a starting point, as I said, is the data found in the open air graph. And by doing a very preliminary analysis on term extraction, as everybody does, we extract some very good keywords automatically and we build a graph. We build a graph and then we apply some uh, machine learning graph, machine learning graph, deep learning techniques in order to, 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 to find connections and bridge these research outputs to specific SDG targets. So what is uh, what is uh, well, so the the question here that we try to address is what is the problem, what is the, the SDG target that the research output is related to, or try to address to an extent, and and by doing this we connect research outputs to specific SDG targets, not only SDGs in general. The second phase is uh, is un, is is trying to 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 answering the how how do these uh, entities, the researchers, the scientists, the labs, the universities and the companies, how do they envisage the potential solution to an SDG target? What do the scientists or organizations propose? So by doing this, by uh, in trying to answer them to, to addressing these questions, the idea is uh, we, we dig into the, the, the output of the first phase, the outputs on uh, from the open air graph this is a publication that has the title health and well-being of secondary school students in new zealand and the trends between 2001 up to 2012 and we uh, and by applying natural language processing techniques we identify the topic what is the research output of this publication if it is a study or a treatment or a drug or whatever according to to uh, the taxonomy of the research outputs of the publications what is the evidence that these scientists bring about the topic and what is their claim in the final uh, in the sentences of a, of, a, of a publication abstract you can see that the authors claim that, that there have been important improvements in the health and well-being of new zealand this is very critical because we want to spot and isolate these claim sentences and uh, these sentences uh, bring uh, these sentences convey a message about the innovation what is the innovation about this publication 
uh, in the same spirit and by the same token, we use the same techniques in, uh, in, uh, in project uh, portfolios. This is uh, a segment from the results in brief of an, uh, of an FP7 project, which is entitled Transvac. And this is, uh, there was a company, LionX, that participated in that project. And by doing the same kind of analysis, we would like to isolate uh, sentences where uh, they, mention, they mention a specific innovation statement, like uh, this is a drug, this is a drug, a potential drug that came out of this project. And uh, this company participated in this project. So this, this um, uh, finding might also uh, has brought in the market. There is a, a drug in the market and so this might have a connection or a contribution to a specific SDG target in health, under health. Uh, so we do this also in the company's website by uh, visiting the, the web page of the companies. We also test if there is a connection to what the publications and the open air research outputs uh, uh, revealed. And if there is a connection to what these companies uh, mentioned in their web page as their products or their services today related to the SDG. And by doing this, we, we, we also connect the, the dots. We also connect the, 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 the innovations and the relatedness of these innovations to SDG targets. So we know that there, is a, uh, there, there was an outcome of this project that was related to SDG Health 3 and for a specific uh, for a specific target under the SDG3 uh, and this company uh, uh, benefited from uh, participating in this project brought in the market a product which is related to this SDG this might be a good a good thing uh, how they approach SDG3 and the third phase the, 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 the last phase the last step is to do a sort of data analytics and uh, try to for impact and tracking progress and correlations with other data that is already there. Uh, so the, the question here is what was the impact of the contribution to the SDG progress plan and how can we correlate all these innovation findings with the indicators in, uh, in uh, with the indicators mentioned in uh, in in United Nations so in on the left side of this slide you can see that the about renewable en energy the, the, the progress uh, the share of renewable energy in Spain for, uh, spanning from 90s up to 2017 and on the right slide, slide uh, part of the, of the slide you can see the innovations that we have traced for renewable renewable energy uh, in, in, the, in, those, in those years. Can we find some good correlations uh, uh, justifying that these innovations somehow contributed to the progress that was made in Spain? Can we also forecast and, and, and predict what will be the future in the next coming years? So this is uh, data analytics stuff here, and it is the third step of what we plan to do uh, by bringing open air into the SDG Go business. That's all for me, and thank you for listening. Okay, great. So many thanks uh, for this um, presentation. So Alessia, uh, do you want to um, to highlight something? Uh, so I ask also the others to join. Let's use only one or two minutes. I see that uh, almost all uh, questions were um, addressed and uh, replied uh, directly in the chat. Uh, but I think uh, even if we will finish um, five, 10 minutes later, I think it's important. Uh, so is there is uh, something that I see that all questions were answered. Do you see something that you need to to highlight from the reply that you gave? Um, so, Clau um, questions to Harzbet, to Alessia, to um, do you want to highlight something uh, in, in some seconds? Uh, I actually have a, a question uh, that relates to to the discussion about the open air graphs and. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been involved in the project called Freya that creates a persistent mm -hmm. identifiers graphs. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you can enlighten us about if there had been any collaboration or any talks or, or in that aspect. Yeah, thank you, Claudia. Yeah, yeah. unless you can, can reply. But uh, yes, there is collaboration. Yes, there is collaboration within Open Air, Freya, Data Site Orchid, and the Australian Research Graph. So they are all initiative in different parts of the world or international. 
uh, and we are addressing the, the, the same issues from different point of view. So we are, we, we are connecting and we are trying not to do the same things twice, but to, you know, do the things in synergies and exchange information and exchange experience and on engaging the people working on, on scholarly communication and on what we can call now uh, scholarly communication graphs. So we are also having um, uh, an RDA working group on the Scholix framework for exchanging the links between the data sets and publications, and also on the PID graphs. So there is collaboration between us, yes. Great, Alessia, thank you. So is there anything that you should highlight? Although we have one more question here, but we will answer in the chat. I think it's, uh, so there are also two questions in Spanish that we can reply here in the chat, but, um, uh, Erzbet, you want to ask something, to highlight something uh, from your reply, um, Panasis? Everything was clear from the... I was trying to, I was trying to answer the totally relevant questions and, and all of them were super uh, interesting, so thanks a lot. Uh, regarding our collaboration with Europeana, it's again a yes. So we find it really important, similarly to what, uh, what uh, or how Alessia highlighted the collaboration with the, with the related institution, uh, uh, initiatives and projects, not to, you know, um, duplicate the efforts, but coordinate wisely. So we have uh, national level uh, collaborations with Europeana, uh, the Daria Ireland and the Daria Greece are the strongest uh, allies. Uh, with Europeana in this respect, but also on the European level, Doria EU, uh, um, we have several occasions to collaborate on advocacy, on research data management, including um, cultural heritage data and cultural heritage sector, and the siloing these two big institutional uh, uh, frameworks. And uh, also, we are frequently joining forces on uh, the uh, policy making areas. Uh, I added some links uh, to the to the answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other any other questions. So I think uh, people uh, so are, are happy with the the answers that you have provided. Uh, uh, let's only just do a final a final check if there is something that is relevant or not, and we can uh, move uh, to the next session. I don't think we have more um, more questions. Um, let's so um, stay with us, don't leave. So we will finish 10 minutes after the time, which is not good for a Friday afternoon, but I know that you this session is being quite interesting. So uh, who will start? I'm not sure, Alessia or uh, Ari. Uh, so I final presentation on some of the, the collaborations. In fact, these are uh, also use cases that we want to highlight and in fact based on uh, projects collaborations uh, so european projects that are working with open air um, as a as already a legal entity more than a project so eric please the floor is yours hello uh, stay with us don't don't leave us um, hello everyone i'm harry dimitropoulos from athena research center and uh, representing open air here in these projects let me share my screen perfect Start with uh, be open first. Okay, no uh, presenter mode. Okay, right. Uh, so be open is an open air collaboration. Sorry, open air is collaborating with the uh, be open, which is the European Forum and Observatory for Open Science in Transport. Uh, it's a third month project that started in two thousand nineteen, uh, Horizon twenty twenty, with a budget of under two million. Uh, it has 17 partners, which are uh, key players in the transport, uh, in different transport um, uh, modes of different transport or in open air and open access and open, uh, sorry, science. So th what is the vision of o Be Open is to create a common understanding of the practical impact of open science and to identify and put in place the mechanisms 
to make it a reality in transport research. And it's doing that by setting up and implementing TOPOS, which is the Transport Observatory and Forum for Promoting Open Science. So promote, regulate, and standardize open science, uh, aiming to develop a framework of common understanding uh, of open science in transport, a map existing open science resources and see how they apply in transport, facilitate an evidence-based dialogue to promote and establish open science in transport, uh, provide a policy framework and guidance, uh, again, for open science implementation in transport, and engage a broad range of stakeholders in participatory process for open science uptake. And it's uh, the projects organizing different themes, uh, basically to standardize, regulate, and promote open science in transport. Open Air is involved in some of these uh, work packages uh, via Athena Research Center. So mapping the existing open science resources um, sources in transport, uh, creating a code of contact, uh, conduct on open science and transport, and the TOPOS Observatory. Um, so what has Be, uh, Be Open done so uh, Opener done for Be Open so far? Well, it's delivered the Be Open Research Gateway on transport research, which is the single entry point for discovering research products available in the open air research graph and relevant to the transport. Uh, research sector. Uh, its initial configuration was based on output of work packages one and two, and now its uh, um, domain experts from the consortium have taken or, or, um, over in order to fine tune the configuration and open air supports them. Um, and we decided that um, this will be part of Topos Observatory, will be further developed and enhanced. Uh, and we will play the role of the observatory for organizations because there is also an observatory for individuals. So this is just a quick view of the research gateway. Um, and this is the top, all the links I will provide later in the chat. Um, and this is the TOPOS uh, observatory, uh, which has the, the blue part there for organizations with, which at the moment links to the gateway in open air. Um, and it's provided by Open Air, and the Observatory for Individuals is provided by Cypedia, and there is also the, the forum for exchanging ideas um, for uh, stakeholders, and this is the first time uh, um, it's been just presented, and it's, there's just a kind of the first uh, uh, slides of it, um, the different modes of transport and multimodal, and for each of them uh, it addresses different topics uh, that are relevant. Now, uh, in open air, we have a document classification system which mines the full text of publications in order to perform content based classification using given taxonomies. So, in open air at the moment, we'll be using some taxonomies, but we don't have a, a transport classifier. So, the, in this uh, project, we also want to create one based on the latest edition of the Glossary for Transport Statistics uh, uh, developed by the United States, uh, Nations, Eurostat, and International Transport Forum. So, this has 10 categories. The problem with this is that there is no annotator or labeled corpus of publications in transport research to, uh, to train a classifier. But uh, we'll be using some of the advanced techniques of Harris Papayeriu, uh, who talked earlier, um, and seeding uh, classifiers from the publications and metadata from the Be Open uh, Research Gateway. Uh, more information can be found in the Be Open project website. I'll share the links in a minute. Um, and um, that's all for, for Be Open. Okay. So, do you want me to continue with uh, Ariadne? I see Ariadne is at the end. Uh, no, 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 please do Ariadne as well. Yes, okay. yes please I'll do all, all, all your projects. This is a uh, sample of projects. Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll, please I'll, proceed. I'll... We, we see that is snowing in, in Athens, so oh, yes, let's yes. proceed your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me uh, again see if uh, share the screen again. It's a different. Okay, let's let's hear these uh, different uh, examples okay. of projects that Open Air is collaborating. Okay, yeah. Okay. You, 
Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So this is the open air collaboration with the Ariadne Plus, which is a data infrastructure serving the archaeological community worldwide. It's a continuation of the Ariadne without the Plus, which is a very successful project that integrated European archaeological repositories and created a searchable catalog of data sets, including unpublished reports, Im images, maps, databases, and other kinds of archaeological information uh, accessible online. Uh, more than 2 million records. And in the PLUS will extend uh, the results uh, along se several dimensions uh, while focusing on innovative services and embed uh, Ariadne in the EOSC. Uh, because uh, I've been told we don't have much time, I'll skip some of the details. So it grew from 17 partners to 41 partners covering 26 countries in Europe, plus uh, international, USA, Argentina, Japan, and Israel. And it expanded in several uh, dimensions, both uh, in, in temporal domain and in geographical locations. So we'll cover now almost all of Europe and it will go from paleoanthropology all the way to contemporary age, plus uh, in the science uh, dimension uh, by including more uh, uh, science topics and, and, uh, and different archaeological uh, things like uh, we, we only had the draw, the draw chronology, now there will be different dating and mechanisms and things like that. So it's expanding and uh, the idea is to mainstream, its objective is to mainstream a data-centric methodology in the archaeological research community by creating a cloud-based one-stop shop to find and access um, in interoperable archaeological data and reuse them in a virtual research environment. So it's creating, a, at, at the first level, a comprehensive catalog for archaeological data sets based on a shared ontology and common uh, vocabularies and goes into integrating in more uh, levels uh, on the item level, the georeference uh, level, and so on and so forth. Um, OK, now the, the, this is the Ariadne website. Uh, and the links below. There's also an, a link whatis.ariadneinfrastructure.eu where you can find a lot of uh, information. And from there, someone can access the portal, uh, which has the catalog. Um, now, the, the catalog is, is searchable according to three facets of when, where, and what. So by time, space, and object and by keyboards drawn from controlled vocabularies. Um, so here's like the what, the different uh, uh, objects uh, in the catalog. And now the collaboration with uh, OpenAir is uh, under one task called Integrating Archaeological Digital Libraries with uh, Ariadne Plus, which aims to link uh, the Ari Ariadne data infrastructure with repositories of scientific publications by exploiting OpenAir and the links to individual journals. Uh, so the idea is make archaeological data more discoverable, accessible, interconnected, and complete. Um, so how do we build a bridge between Ariadne and OpenAir? Well, uh, in the previous pro uh, project, there was a very small pilot where we developed uh, text mining, citation extraction, and matching algorithms, which was run on um, archaeology data service gray literature reports. This is uh, excavation reports. Uh, and we only tested it on uh, medical history and epidemiological journals, so EPubMed uh, uh, can repositories. And but already, but even there, found 300 relations uh, covering a broad archaeological kind of uh, fields like anthropology, paleontology, ceramics, and so on forth. Uh, these were validated by an archaeologist which said that the vast majority of records were absolutely useful and relevant. And even the director of ADS, uh, Professor Julian Richards, said that uh, given that gray literature is rarely well referenced in publications, making these connections is a positive result. So that went very well. So in, in Ariadne Plus, we, we will expand that to by searching in all of the open air space and also uh, using data sets from uh, from Ariadne Plus, har harvesting their metadata, and see if publications cite any of those. So we will try to build relationships between the two, uh, which will be shown in both portals, and could also improve the configuration of the digital, digital humanities and cultural heritage uh, gateway mentioned earlier. Uh, another thing is we will be improving metadata of published papers by exploring the possibility of using the Ariadne Plus named entity recognition service. Well, the other thing I want to I forgot to say is that Ariadne, apart from uh, 
collecting all these uh, um, objects and repositories and creating the catalog also has a um, a palette of services that is developing or cutting edge services. So the this uh, named entity recognition service, which was developed in the previous project by other partners from University of South Wales, I think, uh, was um, based uh, was further developed into Text Crowd, a cloud based NLP tool, uh, which was a science demonstrator within the EOS Pilot EU project. And there's the link. Uh, and in this task, we'll be collaborating with the University of York and University of South Wales to see if we can use the, that service to extract uh, information from published uh, uh, from uh, to enrich basically the published papers. Uh, a, th a final thing, uh, it was a very interesting collaboration between uh, uh, Open Air and, uh, and Ariadne Plus. Uh, concerning data management plans. So, you know, we have the Argus tool and they had uh, an online template for a data management uh, plan, which was based on guidelines from Horizon 2020 and designed according to the Parthenos guidelines, um, but dedicated to archaeologically, to archaeology uh, RDMs. Uh, whereas we have uh, Argos, which is, uh, you know, an online tool um, which offers many templates. It's based on uh, Open uh, DMP, which was a, a collaboration between Open Air and EU DAT, and it's in the interdisciplinary. So we wanted to expand by adding uh, archaeological uh, templates relevant to the archaeological domain, and they wanted to learn from us and also use some of the um, benefits of Argos, which is like uh, creating machine actionable DMPs and linking two years components out of the box and things like that. So there is a lot of area that was covered and which is uh, described in the blog post, post um, and the link is below. Uh, but basically, initially, we there was a collaboration to see what were the, the, the tools that were available in archaeology for creating DMPs. So not only uh, um, the one from created by Ariadne. So looking at uh, the commonalities and differences of all these uh, tools and how they are applied, uh, aligned with fair principles and global standards. And then um, the both the Ariadne template and the Argos tool were en enriched with uh, guidelines for better navigation and literacy uh, on RDM. And the template, uh, I mean, the output was that the template is now available from the Argos uh, platform uh, based on the Ariadne Plus uh, DMP, uh, but it's enriched with open air APIs that's providing, you know, the extra capabilities, especially for archaeological data, which are reused, and also enabling compliance with RDA common standards. Um, uh, uh, Argos can export now in, uh, uh, from DMPs in, in that uh, format, which uh, I think that um, uh, Ariadne is trying to create an importer, importer so that they can uh, use uh, directly the output uh, of us while keeping also their own uh, DMP. Um, uh, th I think that's it for now. Uh, thank you. And any questions, I'm happy to answer. Great. So. Uh, let's let's proceed the lesson just to to have more to finalize uh, briefly okay uh, let's highlight the, the other projects and then we can finalize okay yes yes i will be brief with the last three projects we are collaborating with so one is big data which is a european research infrastructure for big data and social mining which focuses on uh, ethical and responsible research uh, based on big data analysis. So um, they provide several exploratories where researchers can work with big data and um, do analysis on different topics. So on explainable machine learning, on cities of citizens, migration studies, social de debates, sports, data science, and well-being and economy. Um, open Air in this project is the leader of task uh, about the online science monitoring dashboard. So guess what? We are providing 
um, a gateway for the Sobic data infrastructure in order to keep track of the outputs of the researchers using the infrastructure. Uh, and all the outputs that were generated during the Sobic data project and also in the current Sobic data plus uh, plus project. And we have also a connection with Zenodo because uh, the exploratories, which are basically virtual research environments, will automatically, on demand of the researcher, publish their outputs on Zenodo so that they will end up also on the uh, Sobic Data uh, Gateway. And the official release uh, for, for the gateway of the project is December 2020, so we are almost there. Then we have Enermaps, which is the open data tool empowering your energy transition. So we are talking about uh, sustainable energy. And you can see that the list of partners uh, at the end of these, uh, of these tasks, and you will find the links to the website and uh, the social, or the social media when you get the slides. So the objectives of Enermaps are to have a single entry point where researchers, policymakers, um, all stakeholders of energy um, can find data sets uh, and can use data sets. So on the one hand, they need a comprehensive view of the data sets on energy that are available, but they also need a place where they can analyze and visualize in an easy way uh, the data sets themselves. Uh, because as I said, the target users are not only researchers, which are geeky, you know, uh, you know a lot of things, but they are also policymakers that need to see something um, clear and they have to see, you know, the, the, the outputs of, a, of an analysis and not the raw data as they are. Um, and for this, it's very important also to curate the quality of the data sets and the quality of the metadata that accompany the data sets. So um, in these projects, the, the importance of fairness and of the, being able to interpret the data that is available is, um, is very important. So what we are doing as OpenAir, we are the work package leader of the work package about the Enermaps data management tool. So we are going to have um, a release of the Open Research Gateway on Energy Research uh, in January 2021. And this will be linked to the data visualization tool. Um, and we are also giving our support on data fairness and openness and trainings that are needed for, for researchers. And of course, we will um, support the integration of this community into the EUSC, the European Open Science Cloud. RISIS. RISIS is uh, a research infrastructure for science and innovation policy studies. So it, it started in 2014 with the RISIS project, and now we are with the RISIS 2 project. So basically they are providing um, the so-called RISIS core facility um, that provides facilities, resources, services, software to researchers in the fields. And they are already very active in the open science uh, ecosystem, say, because they are uh, already using Zenodo as a repository for the outputs and outcomes of the projects and the researcher using the infrastructure. They have um, a virtual research environment where uh, they can uh, run algorithm and access uh, open data. And with the RISIS2, um, we will have an enhanced open data virtual research environment, and we will offer the um, two dashboards, in fact. So one thematic dashboard, which is um, a thematic um, open research gateway, and one gateway instead for monitoring the, the outputs of the infrastructure. 
and this will all be connected in the virtual research environment they have so that from one single entry point they will access uh, the created data sets that they are the other members of the projects are preparing and they will have also access to uh, the dashboard that OpenAir provides and the official release for this will be again December 2020. And yes, okay, I already mentioned the Zenodo community. So let's go to the last slide because all these projects you have heard about today, they all contribute to the Open Air Research Graph. Their researchers can use the Open Air Research Graph. So if they need it for research, if they need it for analysis, they, they, they want to calculate their own indicators, they can take the graph and use it as they want because the graph is CC by and is made available for everyone. And we would like also to thank all the projects and also all the panelists that presented before for their help in having better and better full text mining algorithms that works well for them and also for the others. And Pedro? This is a great way to, to, to finish this session because the Connect is in fact a service and this um, services uh, that open air offer to research communities and research infrastructures, but we can only build these services with the support in a kind of community effort. So thank you very much, Alessia. So um, uh, I see that there are no questions, but uh, every, there is one question that I have already answered uh, about uh, if um, uh, a specific information about Ariadne, if it's already um, as free or Eric, uh, I replied, but if you have more information, please be aware of that. So please check it in the, in the, in the chat, okay, in the, the Q&A. Um, and thank you for, um, feel free to join us, uh, Eric, with the, with the beautiful view with snow in, in Athens. <laughs> um, it's not, but it, 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 uh, from what I know, it's trying to see how it will continue at the end. They are still a project. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, as we have uh, 19 minutes past uh, the hour, but I think it was quite useful and it was a challenge to have all these use cases and I think it was quite a uh, benefit for this session. Uh, so many thanks for all the speakers. Uh, Alessia uh, and Eric, thank you for this uh, last presentation. And Alessia, uh, thank you for all the great work that you are doing, managing this new service in open air and for all the technical team, they do a great job uh, improving um, all the uh, capabilities and functionalities of this service to provide a robust uh, service for our, uh, for our users and for our communities and research infrastructure. So thank you. We are coming to an end. Um, Alessia, Eric, do you have something to say? I see there's a question. From oh, there is a question. Yeah, that Connect is in beta. When do you expect it to be finished? Okay, okay, this is important. So maybe maybe it's good if you do a kind of clarification in terms of um, timeline to have um, everything, those that are in production, the service, could you clarify, uh, Alessia, as a, a last information? Yes, yes, I can say that um, we have um, all, all the gateways um, are ready to are ready for production. Let's say. They are not in production because we wanted to have more content. So now that we have it, uh, we are ready to actually put them in production, so not beta anymore. And so all the gateways will be in production except those for the projects that we just presented because we are still working on them so um, the first release uh, that i mentioned they will be on beta of course um, but the rest they will all go in production and we'll use the content that is available also on explore.openair.eu great thank you so now uh, now it's clear they were in beta because we wanted to have our the expansion of our graph now that we have this new research graph i think we um so everything will be in production so thank you very much so we are coming to an end so thank you for those that uh, resistance the um, that are here with us until the end so uh in fact it were we we had five great days uh, with uh, 
all our five public sessions, um, more than uh, 700 people attended to our um, sessions. Uh, so many thanks. You were part of that. So you are part of uh, open air. You all are part of the open air community and uh, to build a, a better world uh, with the open science. So thank you all and see you uh, next week for those that are interested in the, for the open uh, access week. Yeah. Open access week uh, the, uh, activities that open air is offering next, next, next week. We are uh, collaborating with several uh, groups to offer some interesting webinars uh, targeting researchers. So be aware of that and see you in the upcoming uh, activities. So open air is here to stay. So stay with us <laughs> to build a better world with open science. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all.